Good afternoon on this Monday, the 12th of March, and welcome back to 28storms.com slash cyclone. I know it's been quite some time since you've last seen us do a video. Fortunately, the tropics have been relatively quiet, and that's allowed us to catch up with some much-needed schoolwork, and of course that is meteorology-related. In fact, this is my last semester as a meteorology undergrad. But it looks like we have a spring break just in time here in America so that we can go ahead and focus on the upcoming round of tropical cyclone activity that will soon be impacting Australia. Starting first on the global scale, we'll see that this is a map of the upward motion across much of the globe, and we can see that the highest concentrations are located across Australia, extending westward into the Indian Ocean. This promotes added tropical cyclone activity so it's really no wonder that we are beginning to move into another active period. And the latest GFS forecast does have the MGO remaining over the maritime continent for at least the next week. Meanwhile, the latest sea surface temperature anomalies across the globe is beginning to indicate that the La Nina episode is finally beginning to erode here. We're beginning to see some positive anomalies show up off the coast of South America. So we very well could get an El Nino, or at least a weak El Nino event, begin to develop by the second half of 2012, but we still have below average water temperatures across much of the equatorial Pacific, and even though we are moving more toward neutral ENSO conditions, it's going to take quite some time for the La Nina pattern to finally break, and as we look more so into the Australian region, we see that water temperatures remain slightly above average. In terms of the actual water temperatures, we see that they are very favorable for tropical cyclone development from the Coral Sea extending westward into the Gulf, Timor Sea, and Indian Ocean. As we get into the specifics, beginning with the latest advice from the Bureau of Meteorology, they are already closely monitoring what they consider to be a tropical low moving into the Timor Sea. By 10 a.m. on Wednesday, they are forecasting this low to become a Category 1 cyclone as it moves off toward the southeast. Thus, that is the reason why they have cyclone watches in effect for portions of the Northern Territory and even Kimberley Coast. The western region is also monitoring a second area of low pressure located north of the Pilbara, and they believe that this system has a high chance of development into a cyclone by Wednesday or Thursday. The latest low level vorticity analysis shows that we really don't have much in the way of any tropical activity in the Coral Sea or South Pacific, and it's not until you really reach Darwin where you begin to look at our first area of low pressure, and as we move off toward the west we also have that second vorticity max located right along the coast here as we get into the Southeast Indian Ocean. As we take our first look at the visible satellite animation, we will first note that there is quite a lot of convection surrounding much of the northern half of the continent. Even into the Gulf, we see that there is a lot of disorganized shower activity. The good news is that the upper level winds, mainly the wind shear pattern, is not very favorable for development in that region. And although we have that tropical low approaching the Timor Sea, as we recall on the latest chart, the vorticity max was located right around Darwin, but much of the convection is located to the west of that vorticity max, which is a good indicator that we're still dealing with a lot of easterly wind shear. So this system is not going to rapidly develop anytime soon. And last but not least, we have our developing tropical area of low pressure here north of the Pilbara, and you can already make out that cyclonic rotation fairly well. And as we turn on the latest enhanced infrared, once again, neither one of these systems are really lacking in significant convection at this time. If anything, the upper level conditions just need to improve a little bit more before we really begin to see any really pronounced cyclone development. And as we turn to the water vapor animation, this shows what the wind shear is doing a little bit better here. And we can really see over the top end, we do have a lot of easterly wind shear. And that is the reason why those convective cloud tops are getting blown off toward the west and away from the center. So as we take a deeper look at the latest wind shear pattern, again, much of the eastern half of the basin is shut down. The Coral Sea is experiencing an upwards of 50 to 70 knots of vertical wind shear, and it's not really until you get into the Gulf where the conditions become at least marginally favorable, and that narrow sliver of weak vertical winds does extend westward, but we really want to see this expand into a much wider area of favorable conditions in order to really see any significant tropical cyclone activity. And as we turn on the latest streamlines, we do see that there are little pockets of favorable upper level ridging located along the monsoon trough. And interestingly enough, both of those centers are located near our two distinct areas of low pressure. The main problem with our area of low pressure near Darwin, 
over the next 72 to 96 hours is going to be the fact that this area is going to try to develop a little bit too close to the coast in order for it to rapidly intensify and even though we do have some upper level ridging located very close to that storm center as you can see much of that upper level ridging is already located over the top end and as that system begins to move toward the southeast that will somewhat eliminate the chances of that system becoming much more than say a category one now interestingly enough the bigger story could end up being what is currently located north of the Pilbara Coast. If that system were to sit over the open waters of the Southeast Indian Ocean for the next five or so days, then this system very well could run into more favorable conditions as we get into the three to four day period before the system begins to move off toward the Southeast. The following is a regional look at the 12Z ECMWF model forecast. Again, this is easily one of our best models across the globe. And as we go into day one and day two, we don't see much in the way of significant development just yet, but you can easily make out the two areas that we are closely monitoring. Here is the one near Darwin, and this is the one located well to the north of Exmouth. And then as we go into day three and day four, it becomes apparent that our system near Darwin has moved more toward the southeast. So due to that land interaction, the European model is not very interested in developing that one into a cyclone. But more importantly, as we go into day five, and especially day six, notice how much our system to the north of Western Australia has intensified. And this could easily be a category two or higher cyclone impact if this model solution were to verify. Now, as a forecaster, you really don't want to put all of your stock into just one forecast model solution. You at least want to look at every single model that you have available to you to see if there is any type of consensus. And at least most notably, your your better global dynamical models. So next up we'll take a look at the latest run from the GFS and sure enough this model much like the European is allowing our system north of Western Australia to remain quasi stationary for the next several days and as we go into day four and day five that is when the upper level conditions are obviously expected to become a little bit more favorable for development and that is when you really begin to see that system take off so again this could easily be more than a category two cyclone impact for Western Australia and also one other key difference between the two models is that apparently the GFS is a little bit more aggressive with the Darwin low but the main problem I have with this solution is that the GFS is really developing that area of low pressure once it has already made landfall and of course you're not going to see that low significantly deepen once it begins to exit its energy source that being the ocean but I simply view this solution as being an indication that we could be in for a prolonged rainfall event with an active monsoon trough across the top end for at least the next seven to ten days but we'll simply just have to keep an eye out on that scenario of course the developing cyclones in the region will also have a great part in whether or not that part of the forecast actually becomes a reality so as we move on to the next model forecast this is now the Canadian CMC run much like the last two models it is developing our Western Australia low quite nicely as we get into the day three through five time period. And it's also trying to develop our Darwin system just a little bit more than what we saw with the European solution. But this is no surprise. If you've been a persistent viewer of our videos, you will know by now that the Canadian model has the tendency to overdevelop nearly any tropical area of low pressure. Meanwhile, the Navy no gaps model is taking a much more conservative approach with the Darwin low. As we work our way into 72 hours, it looks as though it's developing into nothing more than a Category 1 just prior to landfall. And then as we go into Days 4 and Day 5, again, much like the other models, this is around the time period that our secondary low becomes much better organized and could easily become a fairly hefty cyclone as it begins to work its way southeast into the coast here within the next 5 to 7 days. So at this time we're going to take a little bit more of an in-depth look into why the models are taking the cyclones in the certain directions that they are. And most notably this is going to be the mid-level steering forecast from the ECMWF model. And as we begin with the current time frame, we'll see that we're starting off with a rather flat ridge from east to west. And this is the reason why we're really not expecting any significant motion from either one of our areas of low pressure over the next day or so. But as we move into 24 and 48 hours, notice that the troughing becomes much more prevalent across Western Australia and South Australia. And as we work our way into day three and day four, this noted troughing should be enough to draw our Darwin system more toward the south, thus eliminating that system from becoming more than a category one due to time constraints as it will be moving away from the Timor Sea 
and quickly on off into the top end. But here as we go into 96 hours, our area of low pressure north of Exmouth is still well off the coastline, and that is because the ridging is just a little bit more predominant here across the western half of the country. And it's not until we get into day five that the developing cyclone finally begins to feel the effects of the troughing to the south. And as we can see, there is yet another trough approaching from the southwest. So there's really no way, unless this pattern were to dramatically change in upcoming model guidance, there's really no way for this system to continue moving off toward the west. I don't really see how this one could avoid Australia in any way, shape, or form, as we have a repeated flow of troughs moving across the southern half of the Indian Ocean. So the best thing to hope for at this current time is that the models are simply off in the favorable parameters that are going to likely take shape here because otherwise if we do get a developing cyclone it is very likely going to impact the western half of Australia. So then just why are the models developing the system so nicely as we go into the day three to day four time period? Well as we look and take a much more in-depth look at the latest upper level forecast from the GFS model it becomes a little bit more obvious. So first off I should note that the green areas that you see on this map are the areas where the upper level winds are very light and the vertical wind shear values are favorable for tropical cyclone development. And just like we saw with the initial wind shear charts, we do currently have the little narrow sliver of favorable winds aloft right along the coastline. But then as we go into day two, yeah, finally this is now day two, and then especially by day three and day four, notice that the troughing is beginning to set up here, and we saw this on the mid-level charts from the ECMWF. And once you get that fast zonal westerly flow streaking across the continent, that is also going to help pump the upper level ridging located just to the north over the open waters, over the monsoon trough. So then as we go into 96 hours, or excuse me now, this is 108 hours, so this is about four and a half days into the future, we see that the jet is really intense here across western Australia and south Australia, and that is going to have the alternate feedback of more upper level ridging right along the monsoon trough and right along the coast and unfortunately more than likely right over our developing tropical cyclones. So as we go back to the latest satellite animation one of the other things I would like to mention is that I am not dismissing the threat from our first system that is going to be working its way into the Timor Sea. I really don't disagree with the latest Bureau of Meteorology outlook. The system very well is going to likely become a category one cyclone as it begins to move deeper into the Timor Sea and everyone under a cyclone watch needs to be heeding the latest information from the official cyclone advice. But simply put, I do think that the second system out here across the Indian Ocean will eventually become our more dominant storm and the stronger of the two as we work our way into the middle and latter half of this upcoming week. And so therefore, all interests, especially along the Pilbara, they really need to begin watching the system and there's a good chance that you will be feeling the effects of at least a Category 2 cyclone in the days to come. So thank you for tuning in to this evening's video. Again, it looks as though we're going to be moving into a rather active period, and 28storms.com slash cyclone will be containing more videos here as we work our way deeper into this upcoming week. So keep it tuned here for more videos, as they will be a lot more frequent than they have been during this recent inactive period of cyclone activity.